All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast bringing you all the best news of the week. And before we get started, I just want to do a small shout out to the sponsor of today's episode. We are sponsored by the company called Eduonix. They just launched this Kickstarter campaign. It is called Full Stack JavaScript Developer eDegree, and this campaign uh, provides a complete JavaScript mastery program with more than 12 courses, 30 projects, and hundreds of uh, source code snippets, along with webinars, certifications, and exams. If you're interested, the link is either in the description of the video when you're watching it or in the list of the links for the current episode. So if you are interested in this kind of stuff, do check it out. Uh, it is already funded. But yeah. All right, uh, let's get to the news, shall we? The first news we have today is um, simple internalization of React apps. This is essentially an introduction of a new project. Project is called JS Lingui, and it aims to be an alternative for React Intel, which was uh, essentially a standard for the React apps internalization. And uh, it is lighter, simpler, and I think I would say it's better solution than what the React Intel did because it's built on the modern APIs that React provides, right? So the way it works is quite simple. Um, you first of all you have uh, so it uses React context as you would imagine. Uh, you have the um, um, internet centralization provider where you can set the language and the catalogs of the translations. And then you have the components where you just use the trans component and provide either a message or ID if you want some more in depth bindings or you know, the phrases are too big and stuff like this. And then using the catalog of the uh, phrases, you will basically uh, it will auto translate whatever you want into the given language, right? So very simple, very flexible and there's as well support stuff like uh, plural things and um, a bunch of other things that you might use even if you don't uh, don't need to localize the app right so there's like date time format and all of that kind of stuff so it is pretty cool and if you're working with uh, localizations if you're working with internalization or maybe just want to use uh, plural or you know correctly formatted dates in your app do have a look it is very uh, it looks very cool. Yeah. And um, the cool thing is it's super tiny. So it's actually smaller than the Redux, not not like React Redux or anything, the, the Redux itself. So it's like super, super small, which is awesome. You know, do check it out. Okay, next article we got is 15 CSS relative units. How many do you know? EM, REM, EX, CAP, CH, and IC. So as you most of you might know I am not exactly the CSS guy, so I can like use it on a basic level, you know, like Flexbox and CSS Grid and all of that stuff, which is relatively straightforward, right? But if it comes to something more advanced, I typically have no idea about it and go Googling almost immediately. Well, this article um, did introduce me to a bunch of things that I did not know even existed. So it talks about all of those relative units that you typically use in CSS to make your life easier. And where do you actually use them and why are they needed, right? So I knew about EM and uh, REM, which is the root relative EM uh, and the VH and VW. But then there's stuff like Vmax and Vmin, the percentage is obvious, Vi and Vb, and it's like there's insane amount of relative units that you can use in CSS, and it seems to be very useful to know about them. At least some of them can make it uh, much easier to build things. You know, maybe you won't even use them in some cases, but it's good to know about them anyway. This is my opinion, basically. So if you are writing at least a bit of CSS, I would suggest you check out this article. It uh, will give you some good insights. All right, continuing, we got how to create a Node.js command line tool with Yargs middleware. This is essentially a tutorial article talking about the very basic Yargs command line utility. And in addition, talking about the Yargs middleware. So if you didn't know, the Yargs is a command line parsing uh, library, which is actually quite nice to use. It has a pretty nice syntax. And it provides an option to add a middleware, uh, which is similar to what you would use in Express or you know any other um, library, online library, whatever. But uh, with a command line, right? So you can actually do like token validation or authentication or um, I don't know, there's like normalization of credentials, for example. Yeah, that's the example from here. 
So this article walks you through uh, doing this with uh, very basic middleware. In this case, they normalize the credentials. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in building command line tools and want to do some advanced things, do check this out. It is a pretty good tutorial. Right, next article we got is linear interpolation. Um, this is not JavaScript specific, although the code here is in JavaScript, but the article talks about the linear interpolation technique, which could be very useful for uh, creative coding, game development, data visualization, and generative art, as the author states here. Uh, the idea of linear interpolation, uh, of linear interpol, uh, God damn it! why is it so hard to say? linear interpolation is very simple, right? You give it, you give the function two values, start and end, and then you give some t, which is between zero and one, and you get the interpolated value out, which is basically somewhere in there, right? Between those two values. So what that means is that you can give in the progress and get a very nice animation out of that progress for just about anything. For example, here on the screen, you can see the circle increasing in radius and decreasing the thickness of the line, all of that with a interpolated function and the progress going from zero to one. There is a lot of examples here. You can use it for point movement between two uh, locations. You can use it for point jumping to a specific target and so on and so forth. You can even use it for color changes in HSL. It's very handy and you can do a lot of pretty neat, uh, nice UI animations with it that would look very smooth. So if you are interested in that, do have a look. There is also a source code available on GitHub if you're interested with all of the examples shown. So yeah, check it out. All right, next thing we got is service worker caching strategies based on request types. So um, the idea of this article is very straightforward. You know that you can use service worker for caching the resources, right? And typically it's done using the URL based pattern matching, which is the, I guess, the most used method, but there's a lesser known, uh, but super useful request dot destination property that allows you to determine a caching strategy by the type of request, right? So, and this article exactly talks about this. This says, okay, so um, what can you actually get from there? Well, there is a bunch of types, including audio worklet, document, embed, font, image, and this, you, you can uh, have a look at the article. There's like a, quite a lot of them actually. And based on those types, you can figure out what exactly do you do uh, with the resource and how exactly do you want to cache it, right? So the um, there's also the code for the um, request destination playground, which allows you to basically play around with it on your own. I believe it is published on GitHub. I remember I saw the link somewhere. Um, let me try to find it. I think it was there was a link to GitHub somewhere here. Um, what am I missing? I saw it at some point when reading the article, but uh, request destination playground, let me just maybe search for it. Um, uh, okay. Just trust me, it is somewhere in there. There's basically a playground that you can play around with, right? There's a source code on GitHub as usual. Uh, so um, um, yeah, basically if you're working with service workers, if you're interested in more advanced caching techniques, I guess, then uh, check it out. The cool thing is that regards destination is universally supported by uh, pretty much all the modern browsers. I don't think it's supported in Internet Explorer, so I believe it only supported in Edge. Um, so let me see, status in, okay, so Blink enabled by default in Chrome, Android, Opera, uh, shipped in Firefox, Edge, Safari. Okay, I guess so Internet Explorer doesn't really support it, but you know, again, hopefully you don't have to work with Internet Explorer anymore. Yeah, so uh, quite a good one. All right, continuing, we got a liftoff, a new baseline compiler for the WebAssembly in V8. Uh, we already talked about the liftoff um, one or two podcasts ago, I think, when the V869 uh, release notes were published. And uh, it is a new compiler, baseline compiler for WebAssembly that was shipped in the latest V8, right? And um, this article goes in depth into showing what exactly changed and how the new compiler looks. So if you didn't know that before, uh, lift off the WebAssembly was compiled uh, by or um, compiled and ran by Turbofan, which was the um, JavaScript and SMJS engine used by V8. And the way it worked, basically the Turbofan works on intermediate representation format, IR, right? And the, uh, so you had to compile the WebAssembly into IR, then throw it in Turbofan. 
And here's the comparison of basically differences between the turbofan and liftoff. So a turbofan has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps, right? This is because it does all the JavaScript optimizations and um, caching and whatever. So basically all the speed in, in V8 comes from turbofan, right? And this is why it's so complex because there's like graph construction, optimization, scheduling, register allocation, instruction selection, whatever you can imagine. There's a lot of things that happen under the code, under the um, under the hood of it. And all of that is kind of required for JavaScript, right? While in WebAssembly case, you don't really care about most of those things because you already have uh, bytecode, right? You can just execute essentially. And uh, the guys was like, okay, so we can just uh, create a new computer for WebAssembly, we'll call it liftoff, and it will it literally have two stages. It will have a function body decoder, which will decode the body from the byte format into the operations, right? And then it will just do the code generation. That's it, there's like two steps. So obviously um, this will cut the execution time a lot, and this will optimize the WebAssembly execution by like incredible margins. The cool thing is that because the function body decoder is actually streaming, right? So you can actually stream, you get the streaming APIs for WebAssembly. This, uh, those two steps that the liftoff does, they happen um, while the stream happens. So it's not like, it's not blocking, right? So the code generation doesn't have to wait for function uh, body decoder to complete the whole WebAssembly file, which is kind of awesome. And they also have some uh, examples in the article showing how exactly it is executed. Um, step by step, how does the stack looks, how does the lo local parameter look, how does the actually assembly code looks and so on and so forth. So if you're interested in all the nitty gritty technical details, they are here and they explain how the liftoff compiler works in pretty in depth. Uh, there's also this image that compares the compilation difference between the liftoff and turbofan, which looks kind of insane when you look at it. It's just like, I don't know, lift, like turbofan is seven, eight times longer, probably. There's, I think there was a number somewhere in the article, but I don't remember it. Um, the, uh, yeah, you can, that's, that's the comparison of at least code generation uh, between the turbofan and liftoff. So this difference is like 10, uh, like eight to 10 times, basically nine to 10 times even, which is kind of insane when you think about it. Um, the downside of it is that uh, for now, liftoff is only implemented for Intel platforms, 32 and 64 bits. They are planning to ship it to ARM and ARM64 to be used on mobile devices, but that's like the future work. Um, there's also more improvements to it coming, obviously, which is kind of insane when you think about it. But uh, yeah, really excited to see where where this all goes and again WebAssembly has been incredible technology uh so far so we're let's see how all of that ends up but yeah quite fascinating article highly recommend it all right next article we got is a structuring a react project a definitive guide an opinionated guide to structuring a react a great react project uh, first of all huge thanks to the author for saying that it is an opinionated guide for whatever reason nobody ever does this but you can never say that some guide is like you know objective, there's no objective way to structure a project. So always comes down to you. So this article is once again, um, an insight into how one of the react developers, uh, or I guess people working with react react developers is not the term I'm looking for structures his react projects. And um, yeah, it's like, uh, it's pretty, pretty in depth. There is a lot of good thoughts here. So you, if you're still struggling with structuring, do have a look at this article. It will give you a very good uh, pointers. There's some very nice uh, things here. For example, the bit tool that I've seen mentioned more than once, but never used it. There's some nice introduction to it. So I think I would uh, want to play with it at some point. I really like the um, uh, tweet from Dan Abramoff right here, uh, who was like, okay, I give in. I wrote a guide on most scalable file structure for React projects. I'm using it every day. And there's the link for reactfilestructure.surge.sh. And if you open it, you'll just see one uh, huge line of text um, in the middle of the screen, which says move files around until it feels right. And in the bottom, in very small text, this is not a joke. Which, um, you know, this this literally is how I typically do things as well. So I just uh, move things around until it feels like it. And um, if you click that, this is not a joke link, what you will get is a tweet from uh, Dan that says, it means literally start by putting everything in one file and when it feels like it's annoying, start splitting them up. 
And when that gets annoying, maybe add some folders. And this is exactly the approach that I typically use because you know it's it's really hard to say what exactly you want to split off and what exactly you want to put in a different file. So this is why uh, I generally just uh, yeah do it in a way that basically Dan does it, and apparently that's not just me. So, <laughs> but yeah, if you want to see other person structuring projects and the way they approach it, then there are some good pointers in this article. Do have a look at it. Maybe you'll find something new, maybe you'll find something useful. Um, I also want to check if my microphone, yeah, my microphone is on. So I'm now terrified of streaming without microphone on as I already did it once. So I'm, I'm going to be checking that from time to time just to be, you know, just to keep my OCD in check. All right, continuing. We got an article called Progressive Web Apps 101, the what, why, and how. Um, yet another one of those, I mean, progressive web apps is all the hype right now, right? So people are kind of jumping in and a lot of people don't really understand what is PVA, um, but they still want to know what is that and they still want to understand them. So this article basically goes quite in depth in talking about what is progressive web apps? Why do we actually need them? What do they bring on board? Not just in terms of software development, but also in terms of user engagement and sales and, you know, all that kind of business side of of things. How do you build the web app, uh, the progressive web app? What are the required parts like manifest, service workers, HTTPS support, and so on and so forth. There's only part one of two. Uh, the second one, uh, second part of the article will be out quite soon. So if you're interested to um, track it out, basically, I won't uh, be covering that bit. But yes, it is a good starting point, I guess, for understanding what progressive web apps are. So if you're still confused do check it out, you might uh, find out something new for you. But I would say I mean, they're, you know, progressive web apps are not exactly that hard. And they seem to have genuine benefits, especially in this day and time when people are uh, not installing any mobile apps anymore, like having progressive web apps seems to be very helpful. So yes, I would definitely recommend learning about them if you still don't know what they are. All right, next article we got is JavaScript fundamentals, this keyword, literally a very big, very in depth tutorial on this. Um, I think this is one of the most problematic areas for a lot of beginner JavaScript developers, and even maybe some some people who've been writing JavaScript for a long time, like, you know, I was I think it took me four years or something to figure out how the, this and prototypical inheritance works like completely so that it clicked in, inside and I was like, oh, this is how it is. And, and now I understand all of this stuff. And I definitely read a lot more articles than, um, I don't know, probably close to a hundred on this and trying to figure out how the hell does this stuff works. And yes, const this and all of that kind of stuff. I did that as well. Yes, that was terrible and painful. <laughs> Thank God we have RO functions now. So if you're still don't understand this, if you're still figuring out the prototypical inheritance, the context and all of that kind of stuff, do have a look at this article, read it very carefully. It does give you good pointers about this. It might help you finally understand everything you need to know about it, or maybe not. That's also fine. You know, as I said, it took me a couple of years basically to figure it out of like, intensive coding and uh, reading articles to be like, you know, why, why is this happening? I don't understand. And then just uh, at some point, it finally clicked. So you know, maybe this article will help you finally understand everything, maybe it'll like eye opening article for you. But I don't know, it's just a solid article on this context, arrow functions and all that kind of stuff. All right, let us continue. Next article we got is first steps with TensorFlow.js. Yes, this is yet another TensorFlow.js tutorial, but this time around it's actually quite a good one in terms of that it talks not just about, hey, let's take this existing model and use it, but it actually talks about TensorFlow.js and uh, sort of the complete pipeline, right? So it goes uh, starting with talking about what is a model actually in machine learning, how do you create one? So it goes from the very basics, basically what you would see in a machine learning course when you just start, right? So in this case, this is like a pricing model, which is a straight line, which is not what you actually get, but you know, whatever, for, for explanation, it works pretty well. There's going into like 3D, 4D spaces and saying, okay, you know, at some, some point, the human will no longer be able to actually come up with a model like this. 
Well, a neural network will. And so what is a neural network? There's an explanation of what it actually is. Um, again, a pretty decent one, but I think I've never seen a clear explanation of what neural network is than from the uh, three brown, one blue uh, YouTube channel. So if you are interested, check it out. It has an amazing video on neural networks. Right. So after the neural network explanation goes into the uh, showing how you actually train the model in the browser with uh, TensorFlow. So first of all, training a model uh, conceptually. So how does it work? How do you actually do it? And then how to do it with TensorFlow specifically in the browser. And then how do you use that model to predict something again with TensorFlow.js? So you, um, in this case, is just use the very stupid model with uh, X and Y points. And then we'll basically predict uh, you give the X and we'll predict the Y. So super, super simple. It's basically that line from the very beginning of the article. And then it goes into using the pre-trained models for more complex things like the pose detection. And I think it was like, yeah, the <laughs> controlling the fish with your face because why not? And importing model from Keras, if you are interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it is it is a really good article that will give you an understanding of just about everything you need to know to get started with TensorFlow.js in the browser. Right, next article we got is, uh, and it's completely messed up, I should probably allow all the JavaScript and styles. There we go, that looks much nicer. So the next article we got is uh, GraphQL server tutorial with Apollo server and Express.js. Just as you might imagine, this is, uh, as you can see here on the scroller, this is a very, very big article. Like, I don't know, um, 50 pages, maybe, maybe even more. I don't know, that's a lot of, let's like, this scroll looks tiny on my screen. And it goes into showing how exactly do you work with GraphQL and how do you integrate Apollo server with Express.js, uh, starting from the definition, type definitions, resolvers, queries and mutations, schema stitching, using Postgres with SQLis as a backend for a GraphQL server, validations, authentication, authorization, pagination, basically whatever you can imagine uh, that you wanna do with GraphQL, it is in here, including testing and e 2 tests, which is kind of great. So I would say this is basically all in one guide for uh, using Apollo GraphQL with Express.js. Um, so if you are interested in getting into it and if you were looking for a very in-depth guide on doing that and sort of all, all in one article that uh, guides you through the whole process, then do have a look at this one. It is quite detailed. So yeah, um, right, continuing, we got Three new features to help our users protect themselves from NPM. So uh, they are kind of keeping um, or keep adding the features to help prevent the terrible things from happening. And uh, that's a good thing to, to, you know, to see happen. Code signing still would be very welcome, but I guess we're just uh, gonna be satisfied with whatever they had for now, which is still good. So first of all, they added the report of vulnerability button, button that uh, basically Instead of writing them an email, so you can now just uh, hit a button on the NPM registry and uh, yeah, there you go. You fill out a bunch of information and they will have a report and they will take action on it as soon as they have it basically, right? So as you know, they do take action really quickly. So all props to them for that. It's really awesome to see a simpler way essentially to report a problem, a security problem with a package. They've also uh, included an improved security advisories. So now in addition uh, to just uh, NPM audits being in run in the browser, you have them in um, npmjs.com directly. So I think if you go to the package, you will see the audit and you'll actually see the advisories now which say, hey, you know, there's a problem in this dependency, this dependency and this dependency, you probably should update them. Um, they also started blocking password reuse of compromised credentials, which is quite nice. So they basically, uh, the have I been pound service uh, by Troy Hunt, which is I'm a huge fan of. And if you haven't used it before, do check it out. Basically the idea of the service is super simple. It's a huge database of password hashes that are purchased from the darknet password leaks. So you can enter your password there and uh, uh, your email, I'm sorry, and you will be notified whenever your email pops out in another leak in, a, you know, sold credentials. It has a lot of passwords, has a lot of emails. And once the uh, password has been compromised there, they basically want to allow you to use it. So that's really nice. That's why you should use a password manager and generate a 
reusable like new passwords for every service right because that's just safe and don't for the love of god don't reuse passwords maybe for the accounts that you don't care about but not for third-party code like come on that's just <laughs> not very good and as usual there's still yeah like two-factor authentication all of the other stuff that was already there so if you are publishing at least some a bit valuable packages on npm please consider doing and you know uh, adhering to all of those guides because they are uh, a good start let's put it this way all right continuing we got an article uh called cross compiling node.js for arm on ubuntu so um yeah the idea is that you typically develop on desktop right so you develop either on windows linux mac or whatever so this in this case the author was developing on ubuntu but he pushed the source code to the uh, raspberry pi which is an arm based machine which means that if you have any um, native packages for node you have to compile them either compile them on the raspberry pi itself which well yeah as the author here states it will take about five hours to compile a clean node build 10 from on the raspberry pi itself directly right so this is uh not not very efficient right so um the the, the question is then how do you do this well cross compilation is the answer and the article goes into details and to explain how exactly do you compile something in this case i think it talks specifically about the node.js uh on the ubuntu uh to the uh to be built for as a binaries for arm architecture hey matrix welcome to the stream uh right so uh the guide is i mean it's relatively straightforward right there's nothing new or amazing about cross comp i mean it is kind of amazing when you think about it but there's nothing new and complicated about cross compilation it comes down to basically installing the right packages, uh, providing the correct flags to the compiler and uh, configuring it right, right? And then building just uh, for the architecture you want. So if you are looking into building Node.js uh, yourself from scratch for this specific platform and you don't have that platform, you don't want to run it on that platform, like, you know, you don't want to comp Nobody wants to compile Node.js on Raspberry Pi for 10 hours, for God's sake. <laughs> Uh, this is a really cool article that basically will teach you how to do that. All right, next thing we got is avoid common hurdles in unit testing. Um, this is sort of an in-depth uh, look into what kind of things you might encounter during the unit testing. Like, for example, you need to mock dependencies, uh, how you can mock them, and what packages uh, you can use specifically in Node.js uh, for... For example, recording and replaying HTTP responses with the uh, Yakbuck, which I think is, this is the, uh, oh, it was Flickr. I confused it with a Netflix package. I think it was named differently, but there's more than one of them. But yeah, so basically this is a guide on how you can use a bunch of packages to mock HTTP requests, mock modules. Uh, in this case, they use the proxy choir mock file system mockfs really cool module by the way um used it more than once and this uh, provides some really cool abstractions mock dates and timers uh, do the code coverage uh, smart fuzzing and all that kind of stuff uh, additional like testing error handling and all those kind of things so if you are interested in more advanced um i guess methods that you could use within your unit testing uh within your unit testing, that should be a period there. Yes, uh, do check this article out. Maybe you'll find some new packages that you haven't heard about or haven't used and maybe they will be quite useful for you. All right, next article we got is build a project management tool with Vue.js, Node.js and Apollo. Three part article, I believe, yes, about exactly what the title says, building your project management tool uh, using Node.js, Vue.js and Apollo and a GraphQL backend, as you might imagine. So if you ever uh, thought about building your own package management, this one is quite nice. It is a very nice looking, uh, uses GraphQL as a backend, as I already said. And yeah, the articles essentially guide you through the whole process um, of creating the thing. It is quite straightforward, uses MongoDB in the backend, um, has a nice tree structure for tasks. So there's some complexity to it basically. And uh, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're looking for a tutorial of a more complex app in Vue.js than just uh, some to-do app, then uh, yes, do have a look at this. It seems to be quite nice. All right, next thing we got is 
complex numbers in JavaScript. This is kind of a very mathematical article. So it talks about exactly using complex numbers uh, within JavaScript, right? So the complex numbers are numbers with the real and imaginal, uh, imaginary parts. And uh, this is the Observable HQ notebook, which basically uh, combines the description and uh, talks about the num uh, imaginary numbers or complex numbers themselves. And then shows the code on, on how you can actually implement those in JavaScript, which is kind of neat because yeah, you know, there's like the, the solution is actually really simple. You just have the real and imaginary properties on the um, class. And um, then you can just uh, create a bunch of tools or methods that work with the uh, complex numbers and uh, do things on them like addition, multiplication, conjugation, because you know, they have their own methods. Essentially, this is not the uh, typical mathematics that you do with uh, simple numbers. Uh, it is kind of cool. So it's, it's really neat to uh, see how you can implement something like this in JavaScript. So if you're interested in more sort of mathematical JavaScript, I guess, do have a look at this article, it is pretty neat to read through. And you know, it's like, it's kind of fascinating how observable uh, HQ notebooks work so well for the sort of show and tell demos as well. And there's yeah, te text blocks for rendering as well, which is um, also pretty neat. Right, okay, next article we got is level up your filter game. Um, essentially a tutorial for array filter methods uh, that teaches you a bunch of things that you can do with it. In case you underused it, array filter can be extremely helpful and can help you save a lot of codes. And uh, how do I put it? Uh, it can basically make your codes cleaner. Yeah, I guess this is the best word that I can pick in this case. But I mean, it's very simple. You know, if you already worked with array filter and you know exactly what it does, you know how it use know how to combine it with map and reduce and all the other methods, then you probably won't really find anything new here. If not, then do have a look, you might find a couple of neat pointers. Um, there is some, some good things here. Okay, continuing, we got um, build the live graph with D3JS and pusher, J, uh, pusher com service. This is sort of a, you know, kind of promo article basically for pusher service, which is the um, live data pushing service. But nonetheless, it talks about using D3JS for create an um, live updated charts, um, which is something that is relatively easy to do with um, uh, D3JS because it supports like the way that it works is just makes it very easy to basically append the data when you already created the graph or change the data, right? So this article goes basically to show how you set up the server, how you set up the basic front end with um, a relatively simple D3GS uh, visualization, which looks like this. So you get a really nice chart. And then it adds the pusher uh, and uh, gets the data from pusher and triggers the updates uh, in the client so that you actually see the chart changing over time as the updates come. The cool thing is that you don't actually have to use pusher in this case, right? So of course they will use pusher because it's their, their blog, uh, but you can quite easily replace it with, for example, WebSockets and it will work in more or less the same way. And uh, one more thing you could do, the D3JS has a pretty nice animation uh, abstraction. So you could actually make those smoothly transition. So if you're interested in uh, trying that out, do have a look at the D3JS animation sub package and um, try to build it. It could be a fun project. All right, next article we got is best open source tools for developers. Uh, I just thought I highlighted it because there's a bunch of tools that I never heard about and they look really cool. So the first tool is a screen cat is a screen sharing or I guess a screen casting screen catting tool. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that allows you to um, share the screen with anyone just by using a small app that you install on your um, computer and then go into the browser and just using a unique uh, keyword that you share to someone and they will be able to see your screen in the browser it looks really nice. It is open source, works on all platforms, uh, sources on GitHub, and you know, you can just try it out yourself. 
Next tool is Manta, the uh, freelance, uh, I guess for the freelancers, the invoice generation tool, uh, also open source available on GitHub. Never need anything like this, but you know, maybe you're a freelancer and uh, you are tired of generating the invoices by yourself. So check it out, maybe it'll help you. Next one is a Brave browser, which I mean, it is open source and um, it's kind of neat. I mean, I use it on mobiles because it has the integrated ad blocking, but I, yeah, people talk about Google tracking you, but I don't know if, you know, using as a different browser will actually help save you from Google tracking. But uh, anyway, it's like, it's a great browser, right? They have some great initiatives there. So check it out and it's open source. Mark text is a markdown editor, uh, desktop one built on Electron. I think I covered in one of my previous episodes. It's quite nice. Has a neat one icon generator that allows you to uh, quickly generate the icons uh, or resize, I guess, them for a bunch of different uh, platforms like iOS, uh, macOS. It, it seems to be primarily uh, iOS related and it seems to be only running on uh, macOS. So I guess, yeah. Uh, VMD, it is a preview for modern files, uh, specifically from GitHub. So if you're uh, working a lot with this, but I like, I'm not sure I want a separate app for this. I just typically do it in VS Code. It still looks quite nice. Insomnia, yeah, this is a pretty nice um, cross-platform REST client built on top of Electron. So if you use something like Postman, that was a Chrome extension. This is basically a standalone version of it. It's really nice. You can save requests. You can modify them. It has like uh, auto suggestions and everything uh, with um, uh, requerying and, and a lot of different things that you can tweak. Basically, it's a pretty neat tool. So yeah, do check it out if any of this sounds interesting. Um, right, continuing, we got serverless next. I don't remember if I covered this, so I thought I would just cover it again because I think this is a really cool idea. So um, the guys behind Next.js want to make Next serverless. They want to make basically Next to be a development only dependency and introduce new package called Next server that would allow for smaller uh, builds and faster boot up. There's been a bunch of discussion here and um, I'm really, interested to see where it goes because next as is even as is it already produces very fast and very small results right and yeah okay there's like if you're talking serverless then you have this problem of cold start and i guess this is primarily what they are addressing because uh, there's a gif here the cold start right now takes about one and a half second which in serverless world is nah, is not very nice right you want to be below one second, even better if it's below like 300 milliseconds. So let's see how that develops, but it would be really cool if we could get Next.js with a boot time of like below 500 milliseconds even, you know, I would say that this is probably sufficient at least for my use cases. <laughs> right, all right, and then last thing I got is not exactly the article or news, but it's just a really cool highlight from one of the uh, guys working at Code Sandbox. Um, he took VS Code and uh, make it work in um, as a code sandbox editor in the browser with grid view, extensions, breadcrumbs, and all of the features, which is just insane. Just think about it for a second. Full VS Code working in the browser. Um, it's crazy. So obviously, you know, he had to mock the whole node part, node, blah, blah, node JS part and like, file system and everything. But just think about the possibilities. I really want to have a cloud editor where I can, you know, install VS code on my some box online, like my server or whatever, and then just log in from my browser and work there and then just execute it right on a server, build it there and in, into the Docker container, deploy it immediately. That would be like a dream. Like if I could get VS Code in a browser, I think that would be like the best IDE I could ask for. And uh, yeah, so I'm really interested if uh, VS Code team will have a look at that and maybe they will make, uh, make it easier to allow running VS Code in the browser. But yeah, pretty cool, okay. So this is it for the article section, I think. Now we got to the releases section. The first release, a uh, pretty major one being Ghost 2.0. If you are not familiar with the Ghost, it is a kickstarted open source, Node.js and JavaScript based uh, blogging platform, or I guess 
content uh, management system rather than a blogging so it's because it's now sort of a powerhouse. It basically aims to replace um, WordPress, right? And it's all made in Node. It is super easy to use. It is very easy to install and they just released version 2.0, which is adding a bunch of features, making it better, nicer, you know, sleeker editor, whatever you can imagine. There's like a bunch of um, things you can do. They now allow extensions to work with just about any part of the platform. So if you are looking for a nice blog or blogging platform or a nice um, content management system, then check out Ghost. It is really nice like as i said i've uh, installed it uh, for a bunch of people and it's very easy to install especially if you use docker they have an official docker container it is very easy to manage it has a really nice admin ui and you can customize just about everything there so yeah highly recommend it okay next release we got is npm 641 which is primarily a bug fix release with a bunch of bump dependencies nothing really outstanding here but uh, yeah always nice to see um uh, Back fixing, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, next release we got is Journey 5 version 1.0. Uh, if you're not familiar, Journey 5 is the JavaScript, Arduino, robotics, and uh, IoT platform. I th Oh, it's no longer just Arduino. That's interesting. I've checked it out a couple of years ago when they just started. And the interesting thing that they actually, uh, they just released version 0.15.1 as 1.0. So they basically, at this point, they say, okay, we are now production ready, feature complete, and everything is great. I know a lot of people have been using it for running code on like Arduinos and stuff for yeah, basically a couple of years now and it worked pretty well. So I'm really, um, it's really cool to see them basically ship version 1.0 and say, hey, you know, now we are prime time ready for sure. <laughs> It's also quite surprising to see they've been in uh, pre 1.0 for so long, especially considering how many people use them. But anyway, if you're interested in IoT and robotics, do check it out. Uh, it is a very nice platform. Okay, next release we got is a Stimulus version 1.1.0. Uh, it is a um, UI framework from the guys behind the Basecamp. It is a very simple one. It uses the data attributes. And uh, yeah, that's basically it, right? So you, have, uh, you just define controllers and the controllers just tap into your HTML that you already have and uh, manipulate it basically based on data attributes. Very straightforward, very simple, just about as any other thing coming out of the base camp uh, seems to those guys flying in a very low end of the frameworks, let's put it this way. Um, you know, if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems to be quite nice and very um, quite, you know, I mean, Basecamp uses it, it means it's going to be around for like 20 more years at least. Come on, those guys have been, have been around for ages and their software has been around for ages and they always support it for a very long time. So do check it out. Right, next release we got is a Serve version 0 0.2.0. If you are not familiar with the tool, is a middleware and command line application for serving static files. Uh, it is still in early age, uh, early um, ages. No, that's not what I want to say. In early stage, uh, so I don't think it's production ready. This is why it's version zero point two. Uh, it is a very nice tool for serving static files locally, for example. And there's, you know, since it's from uh, Luke Edwards, the guy behind Polka, it is super optimized. It already produces some insane uh, performance. And I guess, yeah, it's 2000 requests, uh, no wait, 20,000 20, requests more than uh, sort of static. So yes, uh, if, if you're looking for something like this, do check it out, it is a very nice tool. Right, last release I have is a uh, Golang 111. You might be wondering what the hell is Golang doing on JavaScript podcast? Well, Golang 111 is now released so it's no longer release candidate or beta or anything and the thing is the highlight of it is that it adds an experimental support for WebAssembly, which is you no longer have to have any you know flags or anything or install beta versions you can just install golang and you will be able to compile it to uh, javascript WebAssembly and execute it right in a browser we i did a video on it so if you're interested i can check out me writing a terribly written Golang library uh, and compiling it to WebAssembly uh, on my YouTube channel. It works very nice. It has uh, access to the DOM. It has all the abstractions that you might want. And 
you literally can write a full browser app in Golang. There are some performance problems right now because essentially, uh, because WebAssembly right now doesn't have garbage collection, the Golang team had to re-implement the whole uh, Golang garbage collection mechanism in WebAssembly, which is kind of insane when you think about it, but it actually works and uh, with decent performance. So it is like, again, you know, WebAssembly is just an area that has been booming a lot lately. And I'm like super excited to see where all of that uh, goes, basically. All right, I think that's it for releases. Now we got a bunch of libraries and demos, starting with Theorem.js, a math framework for computations in JavaScript. Um, the landing page doesn't really tell you much about it, but if we go to the documentation, you will see that there's a bunch of methods available for algebra, cryptography, fractions, generators, numbers, random statistics, tri trigonometry, and basically whatever you can imagine uh, related to mathematics. It seems quite nice. Like I know that I won't probably never use something like this because I don't really work that much with mathematics myself, you know, on a lower level. But uh, yeah, you know, if you're working with mathematics and if you're in need of functions like this, do check it out. Maybe you'll find what you need in here. Next thing we got is React Suspense Starter. Um, experiment with React Suspense right meow uh, because yeah, of course it has to be right meow. Um, so the React Suspense is this new React uh, thing that was released in React 16.4, right? It allows you to uh, suspense your uh, components until the until they load, right? So it's, it's very easy to use, but you have to know about it and you have to know how to set everything up. And this is basically sort of a boilerplate for playing around with it. I mean, in reality, all you have to do is you have to wrap your uh, component and placeholder, React placeholder, right? You have to uh, set the delay, you have to set the fallback, and then you have to create the thing component, which will basically be asynchronous, right? So this is a very, very simple starter. So it doesn't provide you any asynchronous abstractions, which I think would actually be nice to do. And uh, yeah. Um, it, it's so if you wanted to play with it, do check it out. I really want to try it out myself because I have had zero time to do it. And I really want to see how the suspense works out and how do you actually use it in real life with like asynchronous requests and, um, you know, components that request their own stuff from um, third party APIs, basically, and how exactly you work with it. How hard is it to do? How hard is it to show the loaders and all that kind of stuff? It is, at least from the demos, it looked like amazing API, but yeah, I probably should do a live stream on that at some point. Okay, continuing, we got uh, JS Lingui. So this is the library that we were talking about at the very beginning, the localization library for React. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is very nice one. It uh, has a bunch of examples here. It supports pluralization, date and time conversion, all that kind of stuff. So it's not just useful for internationalization. Again, if you're working with uh, localizations or you want to do like plurals or daytime formatting, check it out. It looks pretty neat and it's super tiny. Okay, continuing, we got data filled JS, a library that allows you to do um, select sort filter math analysis on arrays of data. Seems to be very similar to link in uh, .NET world. If you ever worked with it, you probably know what it is. So basically you can run um, querying methods and, you know, a sort of manipulation methods basically on arrays and objects as if they were uh, databases, right? Which is not a new idea by any means, but yeah, it seems to have a decent amount of uh, operators that you can use. And uh, I don't know, I'm like, I always try to keep it low and just use the integrated into the JavaScript operators. Like, I mean, you already have filter map reduce and that covers like 95% of the cases. Sometimes you might want to something more complex, but then again, you know, looking at the examples, you can easily rewrite that into the simple JavaScript functions, but oh, well, you know, maybe you need something like this. Maybe I'm just uh, not seeing the more complex cases. So do check it out. Okay, next library we got is React Qt. Um, the naming is slightly confusing. It's actually a Qt JSON render in React. Not sure why it's not React Qt JSON, but uh, there you go. This is basically how it looks. It just renders JSON in a nice formatted 
uh, look there is a demo available as always it is very simple very straightforward it is quite small just three kilobytes of size no external, no external dependencies or uh, css super simple super nice so you know if you're looking to render json in your app do check it out uh, seems to be very neat right uh, next thing we got is uh, Gilly's AR. At least I hope this is how you read that. It is a JavaScript object detection lightweight library for augmented reality uh, using WebXR. Um, so you can use, yeah, it basically uses WebGL and AR, WebAR uh, or WebXR um, um, API to do object detection. There is a demo available. You have to use it on mobile device or whatever has a camera. So there's like, uh, there's a web XR coffee demo that detects coffee because why not? <laughs> Which is kind of neat, you know, if you were interested in how do you tie in the um, web AR or web XR API with, uh, I guess, neural network. I don't know if it uses neural network. It's actually, I haven't had a chance to check out what exactly it uses underneath, but I'm guessing there's something like TensorFlow Pro. Yeah, there's neural networks uh, right here. Basic for JSON, I guess those are pre-trained models. Uh, yeah, basically check it out. It seems to be pretty cool. Next thing we got is the Puppeteer Recorder. Uh, so this is the extension we talked about in the last podcast. The extension that allows you to, a Chrome extension that allows you to record your interactions and generate a Puppeteer script out of that. Uh, last time I said that I couldn't find this source code and uh, later on in the uh, YouTube video, the recording of the podcast, one of the viewers pointed out that they published the source on GitHub right now. So if you are interested in uh, checking out the source and seeing how it was made or maybe forking it and changing it or you know doing something with it, do check it out. It is now available on GitHub and seems to be pretty nice. All right, next thing we got is MDX deck. Uh, MDX seems to be advancing very fast and gaining in popularity very fast. This is MDX based presentation decks. So you can actually create presentation in uh, Markdown uh, with JSX, which means you can, uh, yeah, you can just show off your React components right in your presentation, which to be honest is pretty damn amazing. And uh, it looks great. Like I think next time I'm gonna do a presentation, I'm probably gonna use that because <laughs> just look at this. It's like you can just lim literally import um, JSX and then use it there, and it just just works. This this looks great. I like I'm just loving it. Right. I probably should start because whoops, I haven't. There you go. Four thousand stars. Perfect. Right, next thing we got is a Speedscope Interactive Flame Graph Explorer for the browser open source and everything. So we already talked about frame, flame graphs and how useful they can be. Well, this is uh, one of the ways to explore them. Seems to be very advanced, allows you to do a lot of very neat things and uh, is completely open source. So it also has a bunch of um, guides on how to import flame graphs from Chrome, Firefox, Node.js, StackProf, RB Spy, Instruments App and Perf for native code and Ruby performance uh, profiling. So it's not just JavaScript based, which is kind of neat to see. And uh, yeah, so, you know, if you are working with flame graphs to check it out, this seems to be pretty nice. All right, next thing we got is size plugin from uh, Google Chrome Labs, which allows you, uh, this is a Webpack plugin that allows you to track changes since the last build. So you can actually see if adding libraries or adding things uh, change your size and how much did it change it. So you can actually figure out if you've added something that was a bit too heavy. Very simple, but uh, can be quite effective. All right, next thing we got is Turbo JSON parse, Turbo charge JSON parse for uh, type stable JSON data. So the um, very simple JSON parser that uh, works on a strict uh, schema. So you provide the schema for it, right? And because you have the schema, the parsing takes a lot less time, right? So um, the author claims <clears throat> a speed up of up to five X faster than uh, without the schema, which kind of makes sense because you know, if you already know all the properties and values and types, it's gonna be way faster to parse this stuff. So if you are looking for a very, very, very fast, now very fast <laughs> JSON parser, do check it out. This seems to be uh, pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, it's a very known approach. I'm actually surprised. I think 
Festify used the same approach for parsing the request, Jason, uh, because you have to define the schema if you want it to be even faster. Yes, uh, now this one is standalone, so do check it out if you are working with uh, a lot of JSON parsing and you know the schema, which I think is true for like 99.9% .9 of cases. All right, next thing we got is GraphQL, uh, which is a curl for GraphQL with autocomplete subscriptions, uh, Graph IQL, and also all of that kind of stuff. Essentially, a command line tool for querying the GraphQL endpoints in uh, sort of interactive format. Yeah, it's, you know, everything you want from a command line um, GraphQL querying interface, I guess. It um, auto-completes all the properties, including the stuff from the server. It allows you to do subscriptions and um, whatever you can imagine. It's all here, basically. So quite nice. If you're working with GraphQL, check it out. Right, next thing we got is Pyodide. Um, yeah, so here we go, more crazy WebAssembly stuff. All right, we got actually three crazy WebAssembly things upcoming. The first one being this Pyodide, which is the Python scientific stack compiled to WebAssembly. Um, the cool thing is that it's not just Python um, libraries expo exposed to JavaScript, but actually Python has full access to the web API. So you can just write your Python stuff, compile it using this Pyodide platform, I guess, and uh, just run it in browser, which is, to be honest, insane. And as a demo, this doesn't seem to be that much documentation for it, which is a bit unfortunate, but um, it's nonetheless really cool to see um, projects like this work. So it looks like you can use stuff like NumPy in browser, which just blows my mind, to be honest. Okay. More mind-blowing things. We got Windows 95 in Electron. Yes, you can download and run Windows 95 as an Electron app right on your desktop and Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. So this is cross-platform. Cross-platform Windows 95. <laughs> Perfect. Um, it is insane. It is built upon the V86 library, which is the X86 virtualization in JavaScript that you can run in browser Node.js. And it uses, it literally runs Windows 95 binaries inside of that VM, which is, well, I mean, it, it, you know, it works. It is slow-ish because as you might imagine, the performance is kind of, uh, but it, it's like just the fact that you can actually do that. And this is not even, it doesn't even have WebAssembly. It's just JavaScript, which is even crazier. Now the next thing is even more insane. This is Windows 2000 running right in my browser. So if it's a view page, so this is literally, you know, this. This is WebAssembly used to run Windows 2K right in your browser. And you can start a Firefox here. Um, because there's a huge overhead obviously here, uh, it does take, like it is very slow, but the fact that you can actually do that, did I actually click it or not? Come on, Firefox, there we go. The fact that you can run uh, Windows 2K on top of the emulated x86, and then you can run Firefox. I don't remember the version number here. It's like Firefox 16 or something, super old. And it still works. It's just like, and all of that happens literally in the in the window in your browser is kind of insane. And come on, where's my Firefox? There we go. So it actually it literally downloads the binaries of the Firefox over the network, then compiles them and runs them in your browser. And uh, it is, yeah, it's really slow, but um, BXJS is not related to RxJS, although I am an RxJS fan. BXJS is, uh, it started as building products with JavaScript and then turned out to building X with JavaScript. So basically we talk about building things with JavaScript here. Okay, and uh, even more crazier things is that if you open say Google in the browser, wait, what? <gasps> ah, wait, what? <laughs> wait a second, that worked last time I tried it, what happens? Google not found, what? Okay. Duck. Duck, duck, go. Does duck, duck, go works? I mean, problem loading. Okay, I guess something broke while it was in the background. But uh, anyway, this is basically Windows 2000 emulated in your browser using WebAssembly and uh, it's it's insane. Just check it out. I don't think the source code is available, unfortunately, but uh, still, I mean, you can look at the page source and I think those 
files are non obfuscated. So, you know, if you really want to see how it works, you, you can uh, view all of that basically. Right. Uh, continuing, we got Git Tutor. This is again not strictly JavaScript related, but I thought it was really awesome. So, the idea of this tool is that you can use your Git commits and comment descriptions. Uh, so, you write them in Markdown and then you run Git Tutor on it. And it will generate a tutorial out of your Git repository, which is just awesome. And there's an example for the tic tac toe tutorial. It's going to look like this, right? So, you got the um, every commit will be displayed as the diff in here, and then there will be a message that basically um, will outline whatever you wrote in your comment message, right? And then you can use like the whoops, uh, the headers to split them into sections and so on and so forth. Seems to be a really nice tool. I don't know um, how useful that would be for a larger tutorials, but for something small and quick, this is really, really awesome because it literally allows you to do line by line comments and, uh, you know, in a very simple manner, essentially. So it's great. Check it out if you need something like this. And uh, the last highlight we have for the demo section is no harm software license. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, it's a license for using software for good It's based off the BSD three clause license, which is, you know, super straightforward, and adds, uh, you know, prohibition for using it when you use it for basically any harm, including environmental distractions, abuse of human rights and stuff like this. So if you are looking for something like this for your project, then do check it out. Let me have a look in the chat real quick. I once heard about git commit helper. Do you know any? Um, that depends on what you mean by git commit helper. Like there was a really cool tool in the last episode. Uh, let me quickly show it. Uh, was it was it in the last episode or in a previous one? Um, let me try to find it. It's a really cool command line to lazy git. There we go. So it was a Golang based tool uh, for writing comments. It literally gives you a UI for staging, adding, editing, pooling, whatever, basically whatever you can imagine working with git. So, you know, if you are not a fan of the command line interface do check this out, maybe you will like this one. I, I personally prefer just using the uh, git commit itself. I have the let me fire up the um, Git uh, over here. I have the, wait a second, uh, let me see projects. I probably should increase the size of the, um, so we can go into, I don't know, like here. Uh, I can touch example JS, uh, Git add. Yeah, but I mean, you don't really need anything for that, right? So you just write git, com um, ah, there you go. My, I forgot, wait, how is that? Oh, because my, I guess my, uh, right, because this is my Windows box and I forgot to git config. I forgot to edit this, um, here's the question. What is my, Oh, Yamalai. Okay, so it's just slightly different. So the thing is that uh, the way I do it is I just specify the template, right? So in this case, uh, it was hard coded. There you go. You just specify this um, in the git config file, you can specify the commit template. So in this case, I specify it as a git commit message. And uh, once you do a git commit, you are just gonna have this template, which will basically guide you through what you have to write, right? So if applied, this comment will add new file that blah, 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 right? Blah, blah, blah. And then you just go here and explain changes being made. I've added, added file that blah, blah, blah again, right? I don't know if you need more than that. Um, yeah, formatting is is a very like formatting is is a thing that is very personal, right? So I don't know, like this is completely up to you. But I typically just use this sort of the temp uh, git uh, commit template that just guides me through the way that uh, I write the messages. And then if I write it for a specific project, if I contribute to something, I typically just look at their contribution guidelines to 
conform to that. And, you know, because this is not my project, I just contribute a bit and I want to be, um, I want to conform to their style of committing, right? Because oh, there's like 25 different styles in GitHub and you have to just look at what they do and follow it if you're contributing. If not, well, then, you know, it's your own style. So just come up with something. I just go for the simplest solution. <laughs> okay. Um, so before wrapping everything up or doing like questions as usual, I got the silly section. So we got the first thing is the... Um, Docker guys, for whatever reason, decided that they will no longer allow downloading Docker CE, the community edition, without logging in. So if you go, if you want to download Docker for Windows or Docker for Mac, you now have this please login button. As you might imagine, a lot of people were not happy about that. And uh, there is incredible, like there's this thread of people discussing this. They closed the issue immediately, but you know, that didn't really stop people from discussing it, including amazing comments mocking the battlefield uh, notes like, you know, we, we um, what was the thing about the, we want users to have a sense of pride and accomplishment when, <laughs> when getting their Docker installer. There is a lot of comments here. And um, the interesting thing is that like, literally you can, uh, if you have the link, you can just download it. So somebody made a website called uh, Download Docker, and there's literally direct links to the um, to the Docker downloads. So you no longer have to register. You can just go here and download them by using the URIs, which is I it's just backfiring spectacularly. And looks like Docker guys don't really care much about that. I don't know. It looks it looks it just feels like a weird thing to do in the first place, but the, you know, it's, it, it's just, I don't know what they are thinking. It's like, it's not going to give you anything. Plus in addition, here's the thing. I already have an account, right? So if I, if I, if I go to hub docker.com, I have my account here because I publish Docker images, right? And this is not, I don't, I don't know if that's the same ID. So can I actually just log in with the same ID? I actually can. Okay. So they do have the same account. Okay. They should make that explicitly clear because this is less of a problem. At first I thought that, Hey, it's Docker store account. So I have to get a new one. This is a bit confusing. But, uh, yeah, it is <laughs> such a painful discussion to just observe, but, um, quite hilarious one on the other hand as well. All right. Next thing we got is this um, software development in a nutshell from the Reddit uh, shower thoughts. Your self, your future self is talking shit about you. And the first, like one of the comments is jokes on him. I'll fucking ruin his life, which is basically, um, yeah. <laughs> software development in a nutshell. Uh, what's the password manager used right now? I am currently using the Bitwarden. So this is uh, my, uh, I mean, I, I've like, I've been using LastPass for quite a lot of time and then got acquired by the uh, LogMeIn, which is a company with some uh, dubious business practices at best, um, you know, and I wanted to switch to something. So uh, someone recommended to me the Bitwarden. It is a free open source solution that you can even self host if you want. It has the premium uh, tier as well, which is like 10 bucks a year, which is nothing. And it like, uh, it also is a uh, family uh, thing. So it's like five users included, which is, you know, it's like super cheap. And I, I decided to just switch it, switch to it and try it. And it's, it, you know, so far it works pretty well. Like it's, I don't think I've had any problems. There's some Minor things I would change. And I think at some point I would probably try to send a pull request to their repository and see if, uh, if they want it. So like, um, uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm used to, if when I click the copy password, I typically expect the window to close because I don't really need it anymore, but uh, those are minor annoyances, but I think they are not that terrible. So far liking it. The Android app is also really well made and works quite well. Uh, so yeah, basically digging it so far. Okay. Uh, continuing with the silly things, Twitter don't ban me. We got, um, yeah, this is not actually silly. I just thought it was really kind of amazing. 
uh, Google, Apple and IBM announced that they are ditching the college degree requirement from hiring criteria. So you actually no longer need to have a college degree in uh, computer science to get to um, basically to be employed by Google or any of those big companies, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So they essentially say that the in modern world, the college degree doesn't matter that much, I guess, in computer science, at least, which is on one hand really weird. On the other hand, I kind of get where that comes from, because, you know, as a, even though I did my PhD in computer science, my uh, master's or diploma, whatever you like to call it, is actually in electrical engineering. So I'm a hardware engineer and uh, all the software development that I learned over the years is something that I learned basically in my free time on the evenings, weekends and whatever. So, you know, it's kind of my, di my, my diploma, my master's doesn't really reflect my knowledge all that well. But uh, yeah, so it's pretty neat to see that movement at least. And uh, let's see how that develops. Okay, and the last thing I got is this uh, super awesome paper from uh, Berkeley researchers that does uh, video to video translation. You can basically record a video of yourself doing anything and then you can take the source video of someone dancing and the neural network will translate the dancing to your figure, which um, looks quite realistic. I mean, it's still, you know, kind of wonky because it's neural networks and deep learning. And, you know, as you might know, it produces sometimes weird results, but um, it looks believable. Oh, shit. I don't want to. <laughs> there you go. Like, just look at this. It it, it looks very good. <laughs> like, this is surprisingly, surprisingly awesome. Uh, the paper itself is also really cool. So if you're interested in uh, scientific papers and reading the scientific stuff, on uh, deep learning and machine learning. It's available in ArcSiv. Uh, there's a full PDF here. Again, this is a scientific paper, so expect it to be uh, not that easy to read, but it is really awesome and uh, highly recommended. Okay, that is basically it from my side. I will be more than happy to answer questions um, that you might have. I mean, will be more than happy to Show off your things. Maybe I missed something this week. Uh, do throw it in the chat right now. Uh, do ask your questions as well. Or if not, then uh, we can just wrap up the podcasts here. We'll do a small break and then we're going to play some Exapunks, which is a software development game from uh, Zactronics, one of the, I think, maybe just... <laughs> even the almost the only guys who do software development games. So this is a hacking game from 1997, which sounds quite exciting. All right. Um, doesn't seem like there are any more questions. So I am gonna go on a short break then. Do you host your episode? Yes, I do export all the episodes on YouTube. So if you missed the beginning, if you missed, if you want to see the old ones, you can just go on YouTube and rewatch all the VODs right there. They're also on Dev2 and uh, CastBox if you just want to listen to the voice. Basically, it is a podcast in a car or whatever. So if you don't want the videos. Um, but uh, there's basically links. I should probably add the links to the BXGS Weekly itself because it doesn't include anything here. I should update it at some point. <laughs> I, I, I do, I'm do. i doing a terrible job in keeping the podcast in a good shape. I'm just terribly bad in there. But um, yes, right. I guess that's that's basically it for today. Thank you very much for staying with me. Thank you for watching. If you're watching this live, do not go anywhere. We're going to play some Exapunks after the break. If you're watching this on YouTube or anywhere, the Exapunks VOD will be on YouTube as well. So thank you for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.